This episode is brought to you by the House of Raw. Discover their elegant handcrafted ceramics and use the code TSMOSH to save on your next purchase. Details in the show notes of this episode. everybody and welcome to season three of Travel Stories with Mosh. Every episode, I share travel stories from some amazing travel lovers who take us on fascinating journeys around the world. Together, we hope to entertain and inspire you to explore the world in new and exciting ways and hopefully remind you of some of your own great travel experiences. My special guest today is someone who has a rather impressive endurance background and he travels all over the world to compete with himself and other fellow travel adventurers. So of course he has done the Inca Trail, of course he has climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and of course he has climbed 6,000 meters up to the Himalayas and he has also completed the Marathon de Saab. But the game changer for him has been the Atlantic Ocean Row, which is the world's toughest ocean rowing competition. And he has completed this unsupported from La Gomera to Antigua. Sam Morris, welcome to the podcast. But can we just first begin the podcast by asking you why you do what you do? Sure. Uh, that's a very interesting <laughs> question, the why. Uh, yeah. but first of all, thank you very much for having me on your podcast today. Um, why do I do what I do? Mm. I think uh, I've always been quite adventurous. And uh, I got to 2015 and I felt like I needed a lifestyle change. Mm. So I signed up for the Marathon des Sables, uh, which is the toughest foot race on earth. For, so for those people who don't know about it, it's 250 kilometers carrying all of your food and equipment across the Sahara. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I got my first rescue dog and uh, I just went on a sort of adventure journey thereafter. And here I am today having completed some of the world's toughest ultra endurance challenges. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. But, you know, you travel around the world and adventure is something that you seek all the time. So is it something that you always wanted to do or it just happened by accident? Always wanted to do. I had mm -hmm. quite an adventurous childhood. I was skiing, snowboarding, very sporty. Mm -hmm. And it's just something I've just sort of continued into my adult life. But um, I arrived in Dubai in 2008 and got sort of swept up in the whole sort of brunch party scene. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to 2015, I thought, right, I now need to sort myself out again. Mm -hmm. And yeah, ju just started to do the world's toughest races. Yeah. So is it just adventure is also the love for the world and exploring the world? I mean, everyone explores the world in different ways. Yeah. But you perhaps want to explore the world through adventure. Yes. Uh, is that right? It but is it, right, yeah. yes. I've traveled to 63 countries now. Mm. Um, when I go traveling, I do like to, to sit on a beach and read a book. But yeah. at the same time, I also want to push myself physically mm. and mentally as mm. far as I can. Mm. So through that, you know, I've been heli skiing in the Rockies. I've rode across the Atlantic Ocean. I've run across the Sahara. I've climbed mountains. I've done all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Mm. Um, I've sailed through the Caribbean, incredible things. And uh, yes, yeah, so my holidays now are not yeah. just all about sitting on a beach and reading a book I, I i probably two out of three holidays i'll go out and push and test myself yeah. but okay, yes so my holiday so exploring the world through adventure yeah. yeah that's fascinating now where would you be taking us on a journey today Today, uh, I'm going to be taking us to La Gomera, mm -hmm. uh, which is next to Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing little island. It's basically a circle and it's an old volcano. Um, and it's about 22 kilometers across mm -hmm. and it's got the black volcanic sands around the edges. And as you go up onto the mountain, you go through a sort of, sort of lush tropical rainforest and then very, very barren on the top. It's about 1,450 meters high or something like this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely incredible, diverse landscape and amazing place and it's where Christopher Columbus um, set off to discover the Americas from. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. But how would anybody get there? Like if you want to go there, why would you go there? So, so from here I had to fly to Spain first of all. I went to Madrid. I then got a connecting flight to Tenerife and I then got a ferry across to Legomera and it's actually where I started my transatlantic row. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is that island like? Is it is it like just normal tropical just yeah, like any exactly. other island yeah, or you're very very sleepy compared because it's to not the rest something that people you know people talk about 
no. you know, uh, different parts of like Caribbean, for example. Yeah. But La Gomera is not something that, you know, people kind of look out for. Yeah. So and you're taking us there. So yeah. give us a little more about if we want to go there, what are we looking at? Why are we going there? You know, where should we stay? Sure. So when people go to the Canaries, first mm. of all, they normally go to Tenerife or Lanzarote. Mm. Mm. This is actually a little bit out of the way. It's a bit quieter. It's a bit sleepier. There's not a lot to do on the island. Mm. Uh, a few little boutique hotels around um, and amazing little towns, amazing drives as well. I mean, when you're mm. driving and you start going up the side of the volcano and you go through the rainforest and the views are spectacular. Oh, okay. So it's for people who want to go away, yeah. still experience the kind of Spanish lifestyle mm-hmm. um, and also have like the nice beaches and the uh, warm weather but at the same time it's a little bit sleepier and it's a little bit calmer so yeah, so that's nice. where you kind of take it easy yes. a little bit and yeah. also there is a lot of adventure there would you say yeah so every year the transatlantic rowing race starts from there and that's the, the big event okay. that goes off from there um, okay. and, and, and it starts from there because that's where christopher columbus um, mm-hmm. started his transatlantic voids so ultimately it's the home of ocean rowing okay. and there's a little bar in the middle called um the blue marlin bar mm-hmm. and it's the home of ocean rowing where everybody who's rowed across the atlantic has their name written on the wall uh stickers put up there from your from your boat name and all this kind of stuff so it's a really magical place for me really really special oh, amazing yeah. okay so of course now we are talking about the transatlantic ocean rowing yeah. competition you're a rower you've done some crazy stuff yourself. Well, I wasn't a rower originally. I signed up for the race having never rowed before. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But then that has also taken you to so many of these adventures, yeah. which brings me to my next question. What, which has been your biggest adventure so far in life? So the biggest one, and it was also the most dangerous one, was the transatlantic row because you're literally on your own. Mm. It took us 38 days. Uh, I lost 11 kilograms in weight in 38 days. So you were in sea? Yeah. For 38 days. Yeah, yeah, completely on our own, self-sufficient. If anything goes wrong, you'd have to um, um, call on a sat phone and hopefully get rescued by Mm -hmm. a cargo ship, which might take one to three days Mm. at best. Wrong. So you You'd started to, on um, in Lagomera, um, did yes. you? Okay, yeah. okay. So talk us through this whole adventure. Yeah. So yeah. so we started in Lagomera. Uh, we set off. There were thirty six boats going at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's now I think um, post COVID, people are looking for more adventures to do. Mm-hmm. And also, I think in the modern world now, I think life has become very very soft. Mm. So I think people now, you know, there's a rise in Spartan races. People are flying around the world to different countries to do a Spartan race or a Tough Mudder. Yeah, because because people are looking for more experiential journeys nowadays. Very much so. Than just traveling to a place and exactly. coming back. Yeah, yeah like adventure travel is really, really yeah. taken off. Yeah. So, um, yeah, 36 boats set off. Within about 12 hours, you do not see another living soul for the whole crossing. Travel and the is really, is really taken off. Yeah. 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 So, are you trying to tell me that for 38 days you were in that one boat? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eat, row, sleep, repeat. That was it. And yeah. how many of you were Three there? Three of us. Yeah. And the boat was eight meters long. And that's um, it. That's it, yeah. And we had 40, 50 foot waves in the middle for about two or three days. So what has been yeah. the scariest moment? Has there been a scary moment when yeah. through those 38 days when you were rowing? Yeah, our rudder disengaged because the waves got so big and steep. On the yeah. very top of the waves, the boat was at such an angle that the rudder came out of the water. Mm. So that meant that it just locked. And then we came sliding down the wave sideways. Oh my God. I'm not sure if you sail or not, but if you're side on to waves, that's yeah. really dangerous. That's when the boat capsizes, it rolls. Yeah, yeah. So there we were in the middle of the night, three of us on the deck, trying, uh, literally watching these walls of water repeatedly come at us, you know, these huge waves. It's just nonstop. It's relentless. Just, And we were trying to turn the boat around to get it pointing in the right direction without capsizing. And that was the only time on the crossing I thought, well, this is it. You know, this might be my life. But actually we fixed the problem. Solutions are problems. And that's one of the things about doing adventure travel yeah. is you're pushing yourself physically, but also mentally. Yeah. So I think people who are going off and doing these things, they're, they're bringing back amazing life skills back to their personal life mm. and also back into their corporate life. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what travel does uh, to people, right? I mean, yeah. you travel around the world, like you discover so many different parts of the world through travel and adventure. And that is why you travel because you love adventure. And then it takes you to so many different parts of the world. But you completing the, you know, Atlantic Ocean Row just on a boat. I mean, I'm calling it a boat (laughs) for 38 days. That is like, that's beyond incredible. And, you you know, but but how were you doing it? Like for the three of you on the Atlantic for 38 days. So would you take turns to sleep and eat and, you know, take rest? So you never really sleep for more than one to two hours in one go. 
there's always somebody on the oars. So we mm. had a three team, so it was a bit more complicated to work out shift patterns. Mm -hmm. So in the daytime, we had one person resting, two people rowing, and every hour we would swap. So you did, so you rowed for two hours, had one hour off during the day. At nighttime, we ended up going to solo rowing, which meant we got a little bit more time off the oars. So, but you come off the oars and you're not just sleeping. You First of all, you get your hydration in, so yeah. salt, sugars, water. You then uh, get your calories in. You're eating five and a half thousand calories a day. So anyone who loves eating like I do, yeah, it, it's a great thing to do, but you're expending around seven to eight thousand calories a day. So that's why you have a rapid uh, weight loss. And in terms eating. of nature, when you were rowing for those 38 days, what are the things you saw? What are the creatures wow. you saw? Yeah. Um, what are the different kind of sceneries that you saw? Um, yeah. Tell us about that. What was the experience in terms of nature? So we for you? saw dolphins probably every other day or every two or three days. Mm. Some of the pods were huge. They're mm. literally as far as you can see, just dolphins coming out of the water. And they come up next to your boat. Mm -hmm. Sharks, however, they don't. They follow you. Oh. So you just see these huge fins coming out of the water. And the fins, I, I don't know, it's probably about four or five foot high, like mm -hmm. the largest one. And they just follow you maybe sort of 10 to 20 meters back. And they don't do anything. Don't think they just follow you, just trying to work out what you are. And a few times we had to dive off the boat to go and clean the hull. And one oh. time we had to do it when the uh, the ocean was at its deepest. So it's five kilometers deep. And that was our nearest land. We, we, we had had a shark following us the day before, this huge, huge shark. Mm. And the nearest people were in the International Space Station. And there we were diving off the boat to go and clean the barnacles from underneath the hull. Uh, we saw birds all the way across. Uh, some whales come up alongside us as well. And, and then these we, are humpbacks? All or? sorts of different types okay. of whales, yeah. Okay. And there was a pod of uh, killer whales actually went by, oh. which was a bit scary. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Because they've been attacking boats off the coast of Portugal recently apparently. right what was the feeling like once you reached antigua oh magical absolutely yeah. magical yeah. yeah yeah so we arrived all of our friends and family were there you know it's like a thousand people there you have all the press and the big interview what and, is it that you conquered yeah. like you know when you you finished it of course you had something everybody has some sort of fear or something that you want to establish yeah. in life so what is it that you conquered by you know rowing this particular race that's a very good question mm. um for me i think tolerance Mm. tolerance it's ultimately will it make the boat go faster uh will me saying anything to somebody even though i think i can do something better mm. or improve the speed that they're doing something mm. would me saying anything actually help us with the end result mm -hmm. so and it's a big learning curve but yeah tolerance i think was the yeah, main yeah. thing and that, yeah. that's beautiful isn't it yeah. because tolerance is something we need in the world today yeah. now of course this was one of your biggest adventures and this is something you, you know you talk about or people know you for it yeah. but have there been crazy adventures that you've done in your life? And because you go on so many adventures, yeah. what has been that one crazy adventure that you've done apart from the Atlantic? I think the Marathon de Saab. Oh, was it? Yeah, I signed up for the Marathon de Saab, which mm. is 250 kilometers self-sufficient run across the Sahara Desert, mm -hmm. having never run a marathon before. So I think that was probably my craziest one, in, just in terms of the actual concept of, for me, having not been a runner before. Mm. So why was it crazy? So, well, because because you're, you're so remote, you're in the south of Morocco, near the Tunisian border. Mm -hmm. And you go through, there's a famous desert there called Erg Chebi, which is a little part of it, which is amazing, amazing famous sand dunes with the, mm -hmm. all the postcards for Morocco, for mm -hmm. example. With the different colors. Exa yeah, okay. exactly. And then you okay. go through the barren desert, you've got sort of rocks, uh, mountains, jebels to climb. But again, being in Morocco, same as the Atlantic, the best thing about it is the stars, because mm -hmm. there's no light pollution. Oh. So you're in the Sahara, Sahara, you're in the Atlantic. It's just, wow, you get the full arc of the Milky Way going above you. So many shooting stars. It was, It's just magical. The night sky yeah, in, the, the Sahara, in the desert. Yeah, the Sahara, going, wow, it's incredible. Okay. That, magical, yeah. that's yeah, the word, it's magical. magical yeah. right. Yeah. So, of course, you know, you've done all these, you know, different adventures, big, crazy, mm. all of that. But, you know, you've visited so many places around the world. So which one would you think is your favorite all-time destination and why? A special place in my heart is Verbier in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time there um, as a child. So I'd go there every winter skiing and snowboarding. In the summers, I'd go there mountain walking, building dams off glacial streams, uh, mountain biking. Uh, and it's super warm in the summer and obviously cold in the winter mm -hmm. and i love the extremes and i just think i think it's a magical place verbier town itself is super cool it's like basically a big bowl facing south mm -hmm. and you've got the grand massive um um yellow glacier 
facing you. Okay. And it's, the views are spectacular. So it's right right at the south of the Swiss Alps, near the Italian border. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about two hours from Geneva. Very easy to get to, but super, super magical place. And the food in Switzerland, well, you know, the meats, I was just going to the ask. cheese as yeah. well. It's all about the cheese in Switzerland. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, you, you spoke to us about Verbier, which is special for yeah. you. But what has been a travel blooper for you? Uh, what has been, has there been a place in your travel <laughs> life that doesn't bring back happy memories? Yeah, there's a magical place I went to. I went mm -hmm. to Libya. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I was in Tripoli, Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. um, I was working at one of the big four. And we won the job to find out where the billions of dollars were for the Libyan government invested around the world. So I went went to to Tripoli, mm -hmm. and I absolutely love Libya. I thought it was incredible. You've got this amazing Mediterranean coast. So you know, should in the future it get sorted out, it's got so much potential. Mm -hmm. It's got ancient Roman ruins there that are the, uh, Liptus Magna, uh, which is a, uh, an ancient sort of auditorium facing the sea. It's just just incredible. Mm -hmm. But when I was there. And I got a call from a friend of mine, an ex-military guy who, who worked in private security and said, Sam, are you in Libya? I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I saw on your social media. Would you mind looking out of your hotel window? Because he knew which hotel I was in. There's only one sort of safe hotel. And I, and I looked out of the window and there was a building on fire. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I said, yeah, there's a building on fire. And he goes, yeah, someone's just tried to attack your hotel. Call your private security number now. So, so I, I said, thanks, Will. Put it on the phone. Called up my private security number. They were like, hang on a sec. I could hear them typing. After about 30 seconds, they said, yeah, someone has just fired an RPG at your hotel. It missed, hit no the building way. next door. Yeah. Oh my God. We think it's isolated, but you're okay. And I said, well, what happens if they come into the hotel? Like, what, you know, what's going on? And they said, oh, your company has not paid for an extraction policy. I was wow. like, wow. So I, so I basically put down the phone. I was a bit angry. Called up my friend Will and said, Will, have you got a, uh, um, like a special ops team in the area who can get me out? And he's like, hang on a sec. And goes, yep, what's your room number? Great. And he goes, okay, should they come into the hotel? Our team's going to be in there in a flash. And we'll get them up to your room and we'll, we'll tag you on. And I was like, Will, thank you very much. He then said to me, what have they told you about sleeping? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, look, if another RPG hits the hotel and it hits your uh, wall, you're dead. So we've advised our uh, guys in the hotel to sleep in the bathroom because then there's another wall to protect you mm. and then in the actual bathtub. And also he said, if you hear gunfire, get a weapon. And I said, what do I use for a weapon? He said, break a chair. So I slept in the bathtub with a chair leg. Uh, and then the next day, day I made a beeline for the airport and managed to get out. But absolutely thought it was a magical country, really welcoming people, so much potential but I don't want to go back there until it's uh, of course, sorted out. Yeah, so, it was the experiences. Yeah. I mean, beautiful yeah. place. But then it was literally a matter of life and death for you. It was. So, you know, so going back would be very daunting yeah. for you if you ever go yeah. back. So beautiful place, but the yeah. memories are not that beautiful. Now let's talk about happy places. Uh, give us uh, one of your hidden gems. If you have more than one or one, Yeah. tell us what's gems. your hidden gem. Um a restaurant called Sheer Rocks. It's it's owned by a chap named Alex, a friend of a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And it's the best restaurant in Antigua. And it's in a resort. Oh, we're going back to Antigua. Going back to Antigua. Okay. Oh, Antigua's magical. I don't know whether you've been is to the Caribbean it? or not. I haven't it's been there. absolutely magical. Okay. And this restaurant is on the edge of a cliff. And it's safe. Antigua is safe. There yeah, is, safe. There is yeah, nothing yeah, to worry about yeah, when you yeah, go there. Yeah. Okay. It, it's got like the world's largest super yachts come in every year. There's also the world's... Um, it's called Tall, I think it's called the Tall Ships Festival, okay. where the largest sailing yachts in the world go there. And you get these really tall masts just all around the island. It's absolutely incredible. And you've got English Harbour and Falmouth Harbour, and they're just filled with... So tell us about yeah. this restaurant and why is it a hidden gem? So it's a hidden gem because the food was, it's all locally sourced. And you're there with all the amazing seafood, you know, and it's got, got some of the best chefs in the world working there. Mm. And the actual setting, you're on the edge of a cliff. So you walk through Coco Bay Resort, which is a very, very exclusive hotel, and you come to the end. And then the hotel's also got like little plunge pools scattered in there. So you can just relax there all afternoon. And it, it's like a sort of informal setting with super, super high-end fine dining. And it was just magical. And I'd been in Antigua for about four or five days after getting off the boat. And again, all the food I was eating after eating ration packs for 38 days. Wow, my taste buds were just... Yeah, it's electric, yeah. And then the other hidden gem, speaking of food, is Chez Voni in okay. Zermatt. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a restaurant that you need to book two or three, four weeks in advance if you're ever going to Zermatt. Zermatt's magical as well. Incredible. Yeah. And this restaurant is set just into a little valley, but you're looking straight up at the Matterhorn. Oh, wow. And the views are probably the best in Zermatt. And the food is incredible. Mm -hmm. And also, you can arrive there 
and have things like a Bloody Mary soup, tomato soup for a starter, things like this. They, they, they have really creative uh, food there. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it's it's all the Swiss, you know, cheeses and meats yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, really, really yeah. Cool. And, and overlooking the Matterhorn, it doesn't get better than doesn't that. Better than that. No, yeah, no. of course. So and if I you do go there, take a Toblerone packet, you know, with the uh, with the Matterhorn <laughs> on there, you can hold okay. it up. Yeah. <laughs> so I see that you're yeah. a bit of a foodie as well, like yeah. you would travel for food. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I would too. And that's a beautiful way to explore the world yeah, as well. 100%. I mean, you adventure, food, I mean, yeah. you know, how does it get better than yeah. that? It's all about the five senses. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, so. so, you know, of course, you know, we, we introduced you as an adventurer. You go around the mm. world um, going on these very different expeditions and exploring through adventure. Yes. Um, but, you know, not everyone out there is an adventurer. But are there specific adventures that you would recommend that people should do once in their lifetime? And if yes, which ones do you highly recommend? Sure. Uh, for those who haven't been into the world's largest sand deserts, I would highly recommend that. Wahiba Sands in Oman. In magical. Oman. Yeah. It's one of the largest pure, pure sand deserts in the world, but some of the largest sand dunes in the world. Very few people go there. I ran across it back in 2018. It took mm. me five days. Uh, with the Amman Desert Marathon, absolutely incredible. Uh, but there are tours in there, so you don't need to run across it. You can literally uh, um, get a four by four in, in there, and they've got like little camps they set up on the way. Mm -hmm. Very few people go there, so that's a magical place. I'd recommend doing a sailing holiday. Again, you don't need to be a sailor. You can get a captain to skip at the boat, go and sail around the Caribbean, go and sail around the Greek islands in the Med. Again, get some sailing in. Everyone needs to experience that. Mm -hmm. um, skiing, heli skiing. I've, I've been heli skiing in Whistler, for example. Mm -hmm. Again, I love the Canadian Rockies. I love the US Rockies as well, but the mm -hmm. Canadian Rockies with the heli skiing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was in the helicopter and I got to name a chute that no one had ever been down before. We oh. landed on top of the mountain, dived in. Magical. Yeah, super cool. Okay, so, so these three experiences yeah. you think people should. I mean, if yeah. people are not into adventure, there's something, yeah. something that they, they should have exactly. in their pockets yeah, yeah in their yeah. lifetime yeah okay so of course we spoke about the Wahiba desert and all these other places that you mentioned but when we come to a few more places like in 2024 which other places do you think people should uh, visit in 2024 well, that's a very good question. Where to go in 2024? Well, mm -hmm. I personally, I'm going back to the Alps this summer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to spend a week or two either in Verbier or Chamonix or something like this. So it's going to be like a trail running and oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, endurance again, endurance stuff. Maybe okay. some, maybe some cycling, maybe some mountain biking, trekking, staying in some high altitude cabins. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something people don't know about. Little hidden gems. Yes. You can book high altitude cabins in the Alps. Okay. Try, try to get to the Swiss Alps ones because they got much better accommodation, much better food, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you you trek up to maybe two or three thousand meters, mm -hmm. and you suddenly come to a cabin, and you've got a pre book because they're always fully booked throughout the summer. And for your uh, nights boarding, you get a meal included. And they normally have a little bar as well. Oh. And it's absolutely incredible. And you're up there with nobody else around. So, literally, so are you saying go to the Alps go in to the 2024? Alps. Go to the Alps. Okay. So, yeah. so uh, but we still have to go to your bucket list. What's on your bucket list? Bucket list. I would like to row across the Pacific. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's my bucket list. But again, okay. you're ditching Atlantic and going to the Pacific yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> I've done the Atlantic now, the Pacific. But again, I need to be in a position again where I can go out and raise, you know, two hundred thousand dollars to go off and, okay. uh, and do this. And that's another rowing competition that you want. It to is. Do? Yeah. yeah. So every year, it it, it um, it's a relatively new one. Um, mm -hmm. You go from Monterey, so it's just south of San Francisco, mm -hmm. across to Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's on my bucket list. And how many days is it for? It, it's about the similar distance. The okay. difference is the first 12 days, 10 to 12 days, you've got to battle through the northern wind and currents. So coming down from the Arctic, the, the sea is very cold for the first 10 to 12 days mm. and it's side onto your boat. So the waves are lapping over the side. That's going to be massive. Yeah. 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 But I think I want to take the box one day. So that's on my bucket list. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All the best. Thank you very I much. hope you row the Pacific as well. And I yeah. hope you go on all these crazy adventures Thank that you. you want to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, with that, we come to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much, Sam, for Thanks joining for us me. and telling us about all these great experiences that you've had and also telling us uh, where to go next in 2024. So thank you and all the best in your adventures. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in today. I hope our conversations have fueled your wanderlust and inspired you to explore the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and let us know what you thought of today's episode. Until the next time, 
Happy travels and keep exploring.